Hello, I'm Simon Owens, and you're listening to The Business of Content, a podcast about how publishers create, distribute, and monetize their digital content. In this week's episode, we talk about an independent newsletter that, since 2013, has generated over 10,000 paying subscribers. With social platforms like Facebook throttling distribution for news and the online ad market collapsing, more and more writers are turning to paid newsletters as a way to make a living. In a November 2018 episode of this podcast, I interviewed Hamish McKenzie, the co-founder of Substack, a platform that made it easy for writers to launch newsletters and charge subscribers to receive exclusive issues of those newsletters. At the time, McKenzie said that Substack writers had converted a combined 25,000 readers into paying subscribers. Flash forward to today, and that number is up to 40,000. In fact, BuzzFeed recently reported that the 12 top writers on Substack make over $160,000 a year each. For this week's episode, I interviewed one of those writers, Robert Cottrell. Ten years ago, Cottrell founded a website called The Browser. He would comb through thousands of articles a day and pick the five he found most interesting, adding a dash of commentary to go along with each pick. As time wore on, he began to notice that many of his readers were signing up for an email digest of his daily recommendations. In 2013, he launched a paid version of the newsletter, and in the intervening years, it's grown to over 10,000 subscribers. I interviewed Cottrell about how he goes about choosing articles every day, what his long-term ambitions are for the newsletter, and why he recently hired a CEO. Let's jump right into it. Hey, Robert, thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure, Simon. So you edit something called The Browser. Can you give us a brief overview of what it is? The Browser is a website and a newsletter which recommends five things to read each day. And those five things are things that I personally have chosen because I think that in each case, the writing is of lasting value. And um, you're not just linking to them. You're providing like your own kind of custom written description of each item that you're linking to. It's more a brief explanation of why I think this is a good piece of writing, why I think this piece of writing is worth reading. It's exactly the kind of thing that you would say to a friend or a colleague if you were recommending something face to face. You'd be saying, hey, this is great and this is the point that it makes. And you said it's a newsletter and website, but it's it's primarily digested by most users, I would guess, as a newsletter. It is now. That has changed over time. We began as a website 10 years ago now, and it was a free-to-air website. Uh, We converted to a subscription model in 2013, and over time we found that more and more people are opting in to receive the email newsletter. The open rates are very high, so I'm deducing that by now most of our subscribers think of us primarily as an email, as a newsletter, rather than as a website. Well, well, take me back 10 years ago to its founding. What were you doing prior to launching it? Prior to launching it, I was coming to the end of a career in journalism, during which I'd worked mainly for The Economist and The Financial Times. And my last job at The Economist was to look after the editorial side of The Economist website, economist.com, at the time when that was evolving from being more or less the print paper just posted online to a website with a personality and a dynamic and content of its own. Um, And I found that involvement in digital journalism, in new media, as, as, as we then thought of it, to be so exciting that I wanted to, uh, to get more involved in it. So uh, I took a gamble, left The Economist, and started the browser together with uh, a great friend of mine called Al Breach. So there were, there were two of us at the start. So it was kind of, you, you were purposefully, it wasn't just a side hobby, you were purposefully trying to launch an entrepreneurial endeavor in which that would be, that would replace your career as a journalist? Yes. And I, 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 I it, in a sense, it's, it's almost upside down. I thought, I really want to do something for myself in new media. Now, what's it going to be? And it actually took uh, several months of conversations before uh, I came to the conclusion, where Al and I came to the conclusion that 
instead of trying to produce new original content, we could do more of a service and be more distinct as an enterprise by helping readers to discover what was best and most exciting in the existing content. And it started as a website, and this was kind of like the heyday of you know blogging. Um, was that kind of your thinking, is that this was like a blog-like website and you might fund it by something like advertising or something like that? We didn't give much thought to the business model initially because uh, I think we were still at the tail end of the time when you thought, well, if... Uh, if I can get a critical success or if I can get a popular success, then somehow the uh, the business model will follow. Um, and it, it was, yes, it was the heyday of blogging. But I suppose looking back, what was even more distinctive was that it was just before the general advent of paywalls across mainstream media. So it was a time when almost all mainstream media was free to air. So it really was a golden age of uh, free content. How did it initially find readers? We initially found readers, I suppose, by by word of mouth. I mean, there was never any systematic or paid marketing. Um, but I think we were helped quite often by the fact that when we would recommend a piece, particularly a piece from a smaller publication or a blog, then that writer or publication in turn would be pleased enough to be recommended that uh, they would give us a hat tip or a link. So it, it just sort of grew organically. And uh, like, when did it become primarily a newsletter? Like, when did you start thinking the, the uh, rethinking the distribution? When we, we we started to rethink the distribution, actually, I'm 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 going to back up a little bit there and say I think that in a sense we've just allowed the subscribers to make the decision there. I mean, we still put uh, the same amount of care and diligence into the presentation on the website. Uh, we simply observe that more and more subscribers are opting into and opening the newsletter. So, uh, you know, we're very, I, I still think of it for old time's sake as a website which happens to publish a newsletter, but I'm going to guess that most subscribers think of it a news, as a newsletter which also happens to have a website. And you might think in a way it's odd that we don't know more about the preferences, the tastes of our subscribers, but it's always been part of our part of our model, if you like, that we don't bother our subscribers unnecessarily. We assume that uh, they would like to read our newsletter. They might very occasionally be willing to look at some service message which contains something important about the site or their subscription, but we are not constantly pitching them with requests for information or updates or preferences or tastes. I go out of my way not to n not to know which of the pieces on the browser each day is is the most popular for example because i'm always worried that uh, if i find out what people want to read then i will end up just giving them more of the same whereas i think that on a slightly more general level what subscribers want from the browser is to be surprised as well as delighted so that puts a big obligation on me to uh, to keep the surprises coming. So if uh, like it seems like then you put a, you put the option to subscribe by by newsletter onto the website not really intending some kind of shift in distribution but you noticed over time that a lot of your readers were signing up for the for the newsletter and enjoyed receiving it via that medium. Um, would you say it's because like your 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 the browser reads kind of like a Reader's Digest, sort of, and so that so it's nice to be able to just open up your email once a day and have here are five things uh, that I should check out every day, and that that's why it works so well as a newsletter. I think that's right, and I hope that's right. I mean, we are most definitely not trying to be anything resembling a news service or a briefing site. We're not trying to pepper people with things throughout the day. Uh, I spend all of my day reading and then at the end of that time, I choose the five things that I think really stand out for my sensibility from what's been published that day or in recent days and send those out 
to subscribers. And I, yes, I rather imagine subscribers looking in on the website once a day, perhaps, or the equivalent, uh, reading the email. And as far as I can see, we are part of a gen, we are a beneficiary of a general shift towards newsletters uh, delivered by email. I mean, I find that uh, there are, I'm, I'm doing a lot less reading of individuals' blogs and a lot more reading of individuals' emails and newsletters now. I think if you're if you're a sing if, if you're if you're an individual writer, you know, maybe not a full time writer, maybe a professional, an expert, an academic, um, these whereas ten years ago you would have had a blog, now you have a newsletter. Well tell me a little bit more about what goes into editing it every day. Like what's you know, when you wake up in the morning and get in front of your desk or whatever, what's kind of your process? I reckon to look at at least a thousand pieces a day, but I emphasize look at. I don't mean read in their entirety, still less reflect on them. I rely very heavily on an RSS reader, which brings the content of websites and publications to me so that I don't have to go from website to website. Um, I subscribe to a lot of newsletters. I do have a lot of bookmarks so I can visit websites. I look at at least a thousand pieces at the level of a headline. And what I'm looking for is writing of lasting value. So it's extremely unlikely that anything in the general area of current or breaking news is going to fulfill that criterion. I mean, anything in the area of topical news today is going to be overtaken by a better informed and more complete story tomorrow. So we're looking for things which are more in the area of ideas and arguments and opinions and also classic long form reporting. So I look quickly to see you know, what's the basic character of the piece. Then if it seems to have potential, I'll read further into it. And that gets us down already from a thousand pieces to maybe a couple of hundred. And then of those, there will be perhaps 20 or 30, which are worth saving, rereading, reflecting on uh, before coming to a final five. But it's it's a full-time job. I mean, it's a job that sort of crowds into every niche that the day possesses. So I'm reading uh, online whenever I can at home or in the office. I'm reading offline uh, when I'm traveling. And I'm always thinking. And are you like taking notes throughout the day? Like when does the actual compiling of the newsletter happen? It happens quite late in the evening. I mean, I th I used to think I could get it out of the way at the end of the working day, but uh, I got two quite small children who will tend to go to bed around the sort of 9 p.m. mark. So if I've not got the day's browser squared away uh, by family time in the evening, then it's going to have to wait until uh, until my late night. So uh, I think our, our idea of a deadline is midnight London time. And most of our subscribers are in North America. So that's going to be uh, you know, end of the day, early evening, if you're on East Coast time. Um, it might be end of the working day if you're on West Coast time. So you send it, um, you send it in the evening then? For me, it's the end of the day. Yes. I mean, that's... Uh, I suppose it would be possible to set it all up and send it in the morning, but the way it's just evolved, uh, I've been a journalist all my life. I respond only to deadlines. So in this case, uh, I give myself a deadline, which is the end of the day. And tell me about the paid component. Like, how did you start? How did you decide to start charging for it? And when was that? Well, we, we were doing the browser, first of all, as a free website. And uh, uh, that was OK for a while. It was interesting to see where it went. Eventually, we decided that we didn't need a business model. Uh, we experimented with a couple of different business models, one of which I remember was to uh, build a native app. This was in the early days of iOS and Android and see if we could charge for the app. It turned out we couldn't. Um, and another was to see if we could sell individual pieces of writing. And it turned out that there was a market for that. But publishers in particular were reluctant to make individual pieces available. So we settled on doing what we did best, which was to produce the browser each day, and then to discover whether we could build a sustainable 
subscription base. And happily, it turned out that we could. Um, but I think what was very, very important to us was that we had been doing it by then for five years. We've been doing it since then for another six years. And I think building up a viable subscription base in a newsletter has to be a long-term business. I mean, we publish on the Substack platform. And when I look at the uh, how the various newsletters are performing there, the top ones, as far as I can see, are us and Bill Bishop, Sinicism. And you know, Bill's been in the business for years too. I mean, you, you, you really have to build up gradually a loyal audience by word of mouth over a number of years. And so when did you like officially turn on the, the subscriptions? 2013. And we did it very, very tentatively. We wrote around and published on the website and said, look, uh, you know, we're very sorry, but we have to eat and we've got to pay our rent. And uh, please, will you consider paying for, uh, for, for what we provide? Um, and we had absolutely no idea how to price it. So we started off then asking for $12 a year. And we got enough of an uptake in year one to make us feel that this could well work. And then over the next three or four years, there was a fairly steady build up to the point at which we remain, by anybody's standards, a very, very small enterprise, but uh, it pays the rent for me as the editor and for my colleague, Uri, as the publisher. So when you switch it on in 2013, what was what continued to be free and what was the paid component? Like, what, like uh, if, if they decided not to pay, what would they get? And if they decided to pay, what would they get then? We decided initially to leave the most recent three articles, I think it was, available freely. And then the paywall came in at that point. So you could look at three articles. And then if you wanted to go further down into the day's offering or into the archives, uh, then you need a, a subscription. Um, we understood perfectly well, as I think everybody has to understand, that uh, unless you want to put a lot of engineering into it, then no paywall is ever going to be really very tight. It can always be gamed by using different devices, uh, by using incognito windows. So you know, it, it relies heavily on goodwill. So really we were thinking, are there enough people who want to support us in doing this? And, uh, and, and happily, happily there were. We found also that of course, because when you put in a paywall, uh, the traffic to your website falls pretty drastically. So I think at that point, our casual traffic fell from something like 250,000 monthly uniques to about 120, roughly halved, 120,000 monthly uniques. And you know, we're going back six years now. So that was a bit of a blow to uh, you know, one aspect of our pride, but happily we'd never attempted to uh, build a business based on advertising. So there were no revenues foregone there. And uh, it turned out to be a lot more rewarding to build up a closer relationship with a smaller core base of loyal subscribers. So but so you put a paywall on the website, like a, some kind of paywall where they could see something very recent, but anything older than that, uh, they had to pay for. What about people who were getting who were reading it primarily through the newsletter? Well, the, at that point, the newsletter was a free option. So when we brought in the paywall, uh, we also made the newsletter into a subscriber benefit. Uh, it, and bear in mind that I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of literature and a lot of science on this and a lot of marketing science in particular, which might say that we could have used uh, the newsletter much better for outreach, but uh, yeah, we were guessing, we were uh, yeah, we were in the dark, and so our, our thought was let's let's be as nice as we can at all points in this process, but at the same time, you know, let's see if people do want to support us. And so, okay, so if I'm understanding correctly, like once you turned on the paywall in 2013, you could no longer receive 
the newsletter unless you were a paying subscriber. That's right. And that I'm sure was uh, a, a big factor in persuading at least some of the people who converted to paying subscriptions to do so. So I would say, you know, the, the, you know, the casual traffic halved. So out of those 100,000 people who no longer came to the site as casual visitors, some small proportion of them were converting to become paying subscribers. I mean, I think back then uh, the initial subscriber base was only two, was two or three thousand. So we lost a hundred thousand casual visitors. We gained two or three thousand paying subscribers. But uh, that that still struck us as quite a decent number, um, given that uh, I th- we were trying something that I think had not been tried before, which was essentially to sell uh, a form of reviewing or criticism for journalism and I, I don't I know that people will commonly call us a, a curation site and you know, 10 years ago uh, people also commonly spoke of aggregators although I think aggregating is a somewhat different business which does actually consist of trying to free ride on other people's work which we never did um, but I, I, I think of what we're doing as being analogous to to book reviewing so you know every couple of weeks the New York Review of Books comes comes in the mail. Uh, it draws your attention to a bunch of books that have recently been published, and it tells you what they're about, um, and it tells you why they wh- wh- why they are likely to be of interest. And you know, that's exactly what we're doing each day for journalism. We're identifying outstanding pieces from a, a very recent writing, giving you an idea of what they're about and an idea of why you might enjoy reading them. And uh, so, but your prices change over time. You said you started $12 a year and then it gradually went up. What is it now? It's like something close to $50 a year, correct? It's, it's now it's now $49. Uh, we, we, we maintain subscriptions at the original rate so anybody who joined us who who took out a subscription uh at twenty dollars or at thirty four dollars uh still benefits from that price for as long as they subscribe because you know we we've been in a process of discovering what a fair price is for what we produce and by that i mean a price which seems to be acceptable to subscribers, but which also allows uh, Uri and me to pay the rent. So yeah, that's consisted essentially of starting very low and then raising the price three times. And we felt a bit bad raising the price on loyal existing subscribers. So uh, we we grandparented them in um, and uh, that allowed us to feel a little bit freer about experimenting with raising the price. So, so yeah, so if they started at $12 a year, they're, they they stay at that regardless of what the price gets raised to. Um, how quickly, so you said you got the initial two to 3,000 subscribers. I know that you guys are well above that now. How quickly did, um, uh, did subscriptions grow over time? And what did you see that was driving that, uh, that those conversions once you had your initial kind of hardcore fan base converted, how did you continue to grow the subscription uh, numbers? My recollection is that we roughly doubled in the first two years and then doubled again in the next two years. And then growth has slowed. So we are still growing in subscriber numbers, but not so rapidly. And that has been in almost entirely word of mouth. There there were a couple of very happy moments when uh, we got mentioned in a blog that was widely read or mentioned on Twitter by somebody with a big following, and that would produce a useful uptick. But if you look at the growth over the years from 2013 to 2017, uh, you know, it's been fairly steady in, uh, in terms of, like, say, a three-month moving average. Um, and then we, in the last couple of years, we put the price up from $20 to $34 and then again from $34 to $49. The subscriber numbers uh, are continuing to grow, but not as rapidly as they did, which you know, suggests that, A, we might have found... Uh, a reasonable price, which is good for both us and for our subscribers. 
and also uh, the sort of subscriber base that we have now, it enables us to respond individually to subscribers, you know, to know pretty well uh, who our most enthusiastic and you know, loyal readers are. We feel a very personal relationship with our subscribers. So I think we are, we've now reached a position of which we feel you know, very, very happy with uh, who we are and what we're doing. And you're at about like 10,000 subscribers now? Uh, somewhat more than that, yes. I, 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 we're, I know that Substack puts us into their highest bracket, which says tens of thousands. Um, now, I think that if we, d we do send out the occasional free email through Substack once every week or two. So I, we're certainly into the tens of thousands if you take in the, uh, uh, the, the free as well as the paid newsletters. Um, we're above 10,000 in terms of paid subscribers. So you, speaking of Substack, you switched over to that platform about a year ago. And for listeners, uh, Substack is this re relatively new platform. It's an email newsletter platform that a lot of write, independent writers are signing on to, where it allows you to create like a paid subscription newsletter where you can send out both free, free newsletters to try to build up your following and then uh, paid subscribers. So, uh, paid paid newsletters so that if you can convert uh, some number of them into paying subscribers, you can send newsletters just to those subscribers. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of prominent writers have signed on to Substack. Uh, I saw an article recently in BuzzFeed that there are several who are making north of a hundred thousand uh, dollars a year on it. What made you decide to switch to Substack? Before we moved to Substack, we were running a relatively simple CMS and website using WordPress. We were using MailChimp to send out our newsletters and we, we were using Stripe for our billing, all of which individually were excellent systems. However, Substack we saw had all of those functions and had integrated them perfectly. So they had a simple CMS, which it quite re when you're writing to Substack, it kind of resembles Medium. It's quite simple. It's very elegant, and you, know, you can pick it up instantly. There's no, there's almost no learning curve. They've got their own newsletter platform, which is completely integrated with the CMS. So you create your newsletter, and then bang, you publish it and you send it, um, and the newsletter platform is very efficient. I mean, the main worry with sending out a newsletter to a lot of people is that you're going to end up in the spam filter. And uh, Substack is very, very good at making sure that newsletters actually do reach the people to whom they're addressed. And then maybe it was actually crucial to us that Substack also uses Stripe for its billing because it meant that we were able to carry over our existing subscriber base without any hiccup. So the, the subscriptions we already had running through Stripe, they could just be integrated into Substack. And the team at Substack were very kind and helpful and responsive. And we had some very good upfront feedback from other people who are using Substack, because necessarily you're going to say to people, uh, you know, are you, are you using them? How do you feel about that? And I think Felix Salmon in particular was uh, was very enthusiastic about them. And we saw that uh, Matt Tybee was also using Substack. So you know, that made us feel that uh, this, this platform could be a really good fit for us. And it has. I mean, I think it's, I hope that it's not changed in any way uh, what we produce, but it has made it, th made it a lot easier, a lot simpler for us to produce it. So we live in an era when like, I feel like everybody's a curator now between, you know, Facebook and Twitter. Um, you know, I curate articles on my social media accounts all the time. What kind of differentiation can you really offer with a newsletter that just curates but doesn't do any original reporting, like especially now that we're entering an era when every single publication is launching some kind of subscription or subscription paywall. Like, 
do, is that something you think about like in terms and you said that your subscri- your subscriptions are kind of slowing down um do you feel like there's a ceiling that you're going to hit without being able to offer something other than curation i'm going to push back a little there about the about the use of the word curation uh i think we we do a little bit more than that which is uh we provide a level of discussion uh about the articles that we recommend which i hope has a value in itself i mean i i would i like to think that there are subscribers who subscribe to the browser primarily in order to read the newsletter for our account of what we've been reading as opposed to simply a source of links from which they can click through to uh, the target pieces. The sort of curation, I think, is generally, there's almost always a problem of quantity here, I think, that when you start recommending things that are good to read, then every curator that I can think of always seems to eventually conclude that if five is good, then 10 is better, and if 10 is good, then 20 is better. So the newsletters that I subscribe to, I value them all. They're all the product of great diligence and intelligence, but almost invariably the signal to noise ratio is falling all the time. The uh, the curator, the editor is just seeking to include more and more stuff in the hope that you know, somewhere there, there's a fit, somewhere there, there's something that moves the furniture. Um, we are very strict in only offering a small group of pieces that you know, I've really thought about. I've really uh, looked hard and I've you know, stayed up late and I've done my best to explain what it is that excites me about them. So I would like to think it's more like a book review than it is like the sort of uh, linking that you might get on social media. You recently brought on a CEO. What's the goal there? The goal is to see if, well, first of all, uh, I am absolutely hopeless at anything to do with administration. I I, I find it very difficult to do and I don't enjoy it. Um, So anything which can put the management and the maintenance of the browser as a small business in more reliable hands uh, is to be welcomed, not least by me. Um, We feel, and this goes to your earlier point, about uh, subscriber numbers. We feel very happy that we have discovered a sustainable group of subscribers who we love and who love us and uh, which make it work for us as a business. But we can't help wondering whether there aren't more readers, more subscribers out there who would like us Um, if only they knew about us. So that's Ori's main mission, I would say, to, I I write the browser, I I find the stuff that goes into it each day, and Ori's mission is to try and find ways to connect us with new readers and ultimately new subscribers. And like, and so how is he doing that? What are some of the things that he's doing that wasn't being done before he joined? Well, I think he's. We we are being a little bit more proactive now in terms of making some of our content available freely through Substack. Not much of it, but uh, a little bit here and there regularly, uh, in, because it's terribly easy to convert from a free subscriber to a paying subscriber through Substack. So if we can reach meaningful numbers of people with the occasional free newsletter through Substack, then we're hoping, we're seeing a reasonable level of conversion from those free newsletters into paying subscribers. Um, we've also introduced a, 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 a we've also introduced a, a system of monthly awards for the pieces of writing that uh, we think have been the two or three most outstanding pieces each month. I mean, I love everything that uh, we post on the browser. So uh, it, it hurts me, in a sense, to uh, to narrow things down further. Um, but uh, we hope that uh, by offering 
prizes, rewards for truly outstanding writing, that may in turn uh, create a little bit more of a buzz around the name and the idea of the browser. And so, again, perhaps exposes to uh, to new readers and potentially new subscribers. What kind of growth could you expect to see? Like, is this the sort of thing that really scales? You said you're somewhere north of 10,000 now. Could you see this getting up to 50,000 to 100,000? Or is this something that's a little bit more, you, you know, something that sh- that's more of a lifestyle business where you're just hoping to very slowly grow it? There's th- There are no technical barriers to scaling in the sense that... Uh, all of the heavy lifting is being done by Substack, and uh, I'm, I'm more than confident that they've got plenty of, uh, of bandwidth in reserve. Now, I think it's rather more that there's a pretty there, there's a pretty difficult line between being a sort of self-sustaining business that grows organically and grows by word of mouth versus a business which has a marketing budget and a marketing function. And, you know, we're sort of looking across that divide and wondering what the returns are from uh, marketing ourselves more systematically and obviously investing more heavily in marketing. But for the time being, we're sort of thinking about that rather than doing that. But if we do go into it, then I'm more than confident that uh, you know, Substack will be able to uh, you know, to handle whatever comes out of it. So like, could you envision a day when you guys have like 100,000 paying subscribers? Well, it would certainly be fun. And uh, it, it would, I mean, the only thing that would uh, trouble me there would be uh, uh, like uh, the thought of um, writing to all of them. But, uh, uh, you know, as it is, our, our mailbag is generally positive and not terribly big. So uh, I think, you know, we could risk scaling a while yet. Um, no, the other, I mean, the scaling that really interests me is rather more on the editorial side, where uh, I am sort of limited by the hours in the day uh, as to what I can read. So I'm constantly juggling the portfolio of things that I read um, in order to swap out things that aren't very productive and discover new things um, that are more interesting, that are more productive. So What I'm doing now and which I'm finding very exciting is to model my reading habits using machine learning and then using that instance of machine learning to go out and look for new sources, new publications. So we've recommended, let's say, 30,000 pieces on the browser over the last 10 years. So we've told, I'm working with a computer scientist, I, we've told an instance of machine learning what those 30,000 pieces are, the machine has digested them all, uh, its neural network has come up with some essential notion of what it is to be a browser piece, Now the machine is reading the same things that I'm reading each day. It's reading the same bundle of bookmarks and RSS feeds and newsletters. So it's learning from my own choices and I'm able to see what the machine decides. And at the moment, the machine is up to about 40 or 60 percent, I would say, which is to say that it produces each day uh, two or three pieces which are unequivocally uh, of the right sensibility for the browser. So I don't want the mach- so to hand my job to the machine. What I want to do is to get the machine up to a very high level of mimicking my sensibility and then send it out to read thousands and thousands of posts and simply bring back a first cut of the you know, five or ten percent of those posts, you know, which uh, you know, which might be, uh, which which are certainly worth my time to read, with a view to seeing if they if they belong ultimately on the browser. Uh, th- I mean, there's a lot that excites me there. Um, the first of which is that I suspect this is a very rare exist um, instance of trying to train a machine to look for quality, and the second is whether once we've got 
that browser sensibility properly codified, properly coded in the neural network, then whether we can actually use it to produce new things, as well as simply uh, drawing on a greater range of sources for the browser. Are there any plans to introduce advertising, or is this purely going to be a paid product? No, I think we are absolutely of the view that advertising is a mugs game, uh, always has been, and the great tragedy of online of media in general is that uh, uh, the, the whole of the internet started off with an advertising driven model and since then uh, it's been a race to the bottom in which almost every publication right up to the very best have debauched the quality of their online content in pursuit of eyeballs so if you compare the print footprint of I don't even want to name names, but uh, uh, merely having a website seems somehow to incite even the most respectable publications to uh, uh, produce a hundred times more content uh, of far inferior to qu quality to what they otherwise would have done for print. I'm going to exempt from that the New Yorker and the New York Review of Books, which I think are still primarily driven by their print heritage and their print footprint, and uh, they almost alone have maintained their historic standards. Um, yeah, there are still pieces just as good as there ever were in any other publication, but there's also an awful lot more rubbish. Okay, Robert, well, those were all the questions I had for you. Where can people find you online? Thebrowser.com, and please drop in anytime and... Uh, yeah, tell us what you think. I'm Robert at thebrowser.com and my colleague Uri Bram, the publisher, is Uri at thebrowser.com. So uh, we're always keen to learn how we can do things better. All right, great. Well, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you, Simon. Okay, that's all we have for you today. Be sure to subscribe to the Business of Content on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. See you next week.